Minister in Foreign Policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world, encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change, and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons, and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook, which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous, and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank, and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now, this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I, for many years, have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank.
Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research on different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India, an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. It, it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. A very good evening to everyone. I'm Nivedita Ray. I'm Director of Research at the Council. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this ICWA lecture on the theme, The Broad Canvas of Indian Diplomacy During the Pandemic, 
to be delivered by Shri Harshvardhan Shringla, Foreign Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs. This lecture will be chaired by Dr. T.C.A. Raghavan, Director General ICWA. There will be an interactive discussion following this lecture. We have a very large number of participants who have registered for this lecture today from across the country and different time zones. And among them, we have 16 participants from different universities and think tanks who have joined us in this panel. Let me just introduce Can you hear the audio? She's in the video talking, but come here. We have with us Professor Zadakpur. It's coming on YouTube. Oh, oh, you're seeing IR and Dr. Dhanuraj, Chairman, Center for Public Policy Research, Kerala. Professor Rahul Tripathi from University of Goa. Dr. Anamika Singh from SRDA Girls PG College, Hatras. Dr. Manalisa Kassu, <laughs> Political Science, mm -hmm. Nagaland University. Professor Kingshuk Chatterjee from Calcutta University. Professor Asha Hans from Utkal University, Bhopneshwar. Professor D.V. Raghupati from the Gandhigram Rural Institute, Gandhigram, Tamil Nadu. Professor Santishri Dhulpati Pandit from Sabitri Bhai Pule Pune University. Mr. Sabbasachi Datta, Executive Director from Asian Conference, Shillong. Dr. Subhash Chandran from National Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, Bangalore. Professor Manish from Central University, Gurujar. Dr. Prachi Agarwal from Sanchi University of Buddhist Indic Studies, MP. Professor Rajpal Budaniya, University of Allahabad, uh, Professor Asima Shahu, Ravensha University, Orissa, and Professor V. Yog uh, Yoga Joshna from Amity University, Noida. Thank you all for joining us today in this webinar. Before we begin the proceedings, some customary house rules. All participants are requested to mute themselves when not speaking. Questions will be taken up during the interactive discussion following Foreign Secretary's lecture. Participants may unmute themselves when their name is mentioned by DGICWA and pose a question or make an observation. All are requested to be brief and to the point. In case participants are facing connectivity issues, switch off the camera and continue on audio mode. Registered participants can pose their questions by logging into the chat as guest option provided at the bottom of the chat window, wherein you have to identify yourself name and your place or location and then accept terms and conditions to start chatting. Moderator will take up the questions one by one. Questions on live chat may be kept brief and to the point. So to begin, now may I request DGICWA to conduct the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues and friends. We are delighted to have with us Foreign Secretary Shri Harshvardhan Shringla, and may I for joining us at the ICWA this evening, despite all the pressures on his time. As you all know, the ICWA was established in 1943 with the aim of deepening and widening the discussion of international affairs in the country. The ICWA is the oldest Indian think tank with entirely indigenous roots focusing on international affairs. Possibly, it is the oldest think tank of its kind in Asia. Its founders were very clear on one point, that while the ICWA would be headquartered in the national capital, every possible effort would be made that its reach was all India. We are therefore gratified that so many of our partner institutions and MOU associates have joined us from different parts of our large and diverse country. Ambassador Shringla needs no, needs no introduction to this audience. He has been ambassador to the United States, to Thailand, High Commissioner to Bangladesh, and during the course of his career, served also in Vietnam, France, Israel, and South Africa. He has been Foreign Secretary since 20th January 2020. In the past eight months, and for the past eight months has been at the heart of our diplomacy amidst a major pandemic. We invited him therefore to address us and use this platform to wield a broad brush on a wide canvas. What has been the role of the government and of the Ministry of External Affairs during this pandemic in the conduct of our foreign policy? So while he of course will be touching 
on all the staples of the Ministry of External Affairs, multilateralism, bilateralism, regional geopolitics, difficult bilateral situations, etc. He will also be speaking on the unusual aspects of the situation that we are in the we, that we are currently in the midst of and the conduct of diplomacy in admittedly very very difficult conditions with these remarks may i now request the foreign secretary to deliver his address on the broad canvas of diplomacy during a pandemic foreign secretary namaste and uh, good evening uh, let me begin by thanking the indian council of world affairs and uh, particularly its uh, director general my good friend and colleague dr t c a raghavan for organizing this interaction on the broad canvas of indian diplomacy during the pandemic uh, i'm very happy to note that we are joined today by panelists from renowned universities and institutions from different parts of the country many of the panelists uh, have uh, have had the opportunity to know and to work with i see professor suranjan das is here sabya sachi datta many others were Thank you, sir. And I, and I do believe that uh, uh, the fact that we have achieved a great deal of geographical representation from within our country, both in terms of the panelists and in terms of reaching out to different uh, institutions and stakeholders uh, in uh, in very diverse parts of our from very diverse parts of our country, is is the uh, very important, unique factor in today's uh, engagement and this session that we are doing. Um, I also want to thank uh, my own colleagues, in particular Dr. Anupam Ray, who is the head of our policy planning division, for having arranged this interaction, and also, of course, uh, the other colleagues uh, of ours in the ICWA have worked to set this up and to arrange the session. It is, of course, for me a great privilege to speak, uh, uh, you know, and uh, address uh, the ICWA. Uh, nation is known by its institutions. Uh, institutions represent our aspirations and also our realities. The ICWA is one of our premier think tanks uh, in the country and the region, and is something that all of us can take legitimate pride in. As uh, Dr. Raghavan mentioned, uh, its roots go back to the years before independence, uh, that India would have a role in world affairs uh, would have been little more than an aspiration at the time. Uh, we were still a colony. Uh, India's independence, the trauma of partition, and the struggles of emerging nationhood were in the future. India has come a long way since then. Uh, our journey has been difficult, and uh, many more challenges lie ahead. There is, however, much to be proud of. Uh, we are uh, a country with a track record of resilience, of achievement, and of constant endeavor. Uh, we remain an aspirational country. Uh, we demographically are very unique, with the majority of a country uh, uh, representing uh, an age group which is below 30 years of age. And uh, we remain a country that wants to make a difference, a country that will not be daunted uh, by the challenges before us. We, of course, meet in very difficult times. Mm, 2020 has been an extremely challenging year. And we are living through what is perhaps the greatest shock to the international system since the Second World War. And the current event, uh, current situation that we are in uh, began as a health event, uh, comparable or more severe to the Spanish influenza uh, pandemic of 1916, 1918, excuse me. Uh, it expanded into an economic uh, disruption, a geopolitical shock, and a social challenge of a magnitude that none of us uh, have experienced in our lifetimes. Over 800,000 lives have already been lost. Countless livelihoods uh, have also been lost. Um, in terms of challenges, of course, uh, um, we have our share of those. Uh, you are all aware of the developments uh, on our uh, in, on our border with China and the line of actual control. Uh, this is one of the most serious challenges we have faced uh, uh, in um, many decades. And uh, also, I think, uh, you know, if you look at the fact that we haven't lost any lives uh, on the border in the last 40 years, uh, um, we haven't seen uh, this magnitude of amassing of forces on the border uh, also in recent uh, years uh, is something that we have to uh, I think, uh, take stock of. But uh, what is important is that uh, even during difficult uh, moments uh, of this crisis, uh, we have been engaged both militarily and diplomatically with China. Um, the pandemic has not stopped us from engaging. Uh, we have used digital means, we have used the telephone, we have used direct diplomatic contacts in New Delhi and Beijing, uh, and we have been talking to each other on this issue. 
uh, we remain firmly committed uh, to uh, making sure that uh, we preserve our territorial integrity and our sovereignty, and we will not uh, uh, yield on that ground. We will remain firm and resolute. At the same time, we are open to resolving outstanding issues uh, through dialogue. Uh, and of course, uh, we can come back to the subject as we uh, go into the question answer session. Um, COVID-19 has presented us, of course, with other uh, extraordinary challenges. Every facet of our national life has been affected by the complexities and difficulties of the situation. Uh, Indian diplomacy and our external policies are no exception. Uh, how we deal with these immense difficulties and whether they are, we are able to transform some of them into opportunities uh, uh, will influence uh, our future trajectory as a nation. Um, and the pandemic and the lockdown it is, uh, that it produced uh, have made us take a close look uh, at some of the fundamental drivers of globalization. Uh, we have also been forced to think about other impulses that have shaped or underlie the current global political uh, and economic order. It has focused our thoughts, our thinking on how we can approach our relationship with the international community was articulated by Prime Minister Modi uh, in his uh, interventions in the recent NAM and G20 summits. The Prime Minister pointed out that the pandemic had demonstrated the deficiencies and the limitations of the existing international system. A narrow uh, economic globalization so far. In particular, he was referring, of course, to the G20, uh, which was created in any case to uh, react to the financial shocks uh, of the 1990s. A narrow, uh, uh, and of course, uh, if you look at the fact that uh, it, you know many of these international organizations and international systems had uh, had a very narrow agenda, I think today it is time for us to define what that agenda should be. Um, and of course, uh, we are working with other countries uh, to balance competing individual interests. Uh, this is something that is uh, that I think COVID-19 has brought out that every country is looking at its own interests, and we need to ensure that uh, there is some sort of balance when we talk about the global order. Uh, and of course, we need to advance the collective interests of humankind. Uh, and I will come down to this later, but as we talk about uh, a vaccine, what is, I think, increasingly important is this vaccine should be accessible, it should be affordable, uh, and it should be there should be some level of equitable distribution. Now, that is not assured, but these are things that the international order, the global order, should strive to provide for. Uh, and it is not surprising that uh, our Prime Minister called uh, for a people-centric approach to globalization uh, and international cooperation. Um, India has been a constructive actor in the shaping of a people-centric international order. We have shared our development experience uh, with partner countries in the global south. Uh, we have undertaken humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations uh, well beyond our immediate neighborhood. Uh, in countries uh, geographically diverse, such as Indonesia, Yemen, Iraq, Mozambique. Uh, we have assisted a number of our friends and partners during the current pandemic. And we have catalyzed the emergence of international organizations with constructive, forward-looking uh, agendas such as the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient uh, Infrastructure. Our effort to shape global thinking and project our perspective have continued through the pandemic. Apart from the G20 and non-aligned virtual summits, the Prime Minister also took an early initiative in convening a virtual meeting of the uh, South Asian leaders under the rubric of SARC. Uh, he held his first uh, virtual summit with the Australian uh, Prime Minister on the bilateral side. This was followed by an India-EU summit. He has addressed a high-level segment of the UN's uh, ECOSOC, uh, virtually addressed the Global Vaccine Summit, and digitally inaugurated the new Supreme Court building of, uh, in Mauritius, jointly with the Prime Minister of that country. And all this is over and above 64 conversations that the Prime Minister has had with his counterparts from different countries over phone and video. India's counsel, its experience and perspectives, and the Prime Minister's personal statesmanship have found appreciation and resonance in bilateral, plurilateral, and multilateral platforms. <clears throat> At the same time, the External Affairs Minister uh, has spoken with uh, around 80 of his counterparts during the pandemic. He has digitally attended meetings with BRICS, SEO, the RIC, which is Russia, India, China, ministerials and joint meetings with his counterparts from the US, Australia, Japan, Brazil, and South Korea, among others. And there are many others. Uh, on my part, I have also uh, spoken and consulted regularly with my colleagues and counterparts in other foreign ministries and would continue to do so. Uh, it would therefore be fair to say uh, that we have been at the forefront of digital diplomacy. 
much of our conversations have revolved around the COVID situation. How can we deal with it? Uh, how uh, can we cooperate uh, with our partners uh, to deal with the issues at hand? First, it was a question of evacuation of citizens, ensuring that uh, uh, there was uh, there were facilitation uh, in to to uh, provide for this uh, repatriation of citizens of our respective countries. There was also the issue of uh, uh, providing medicines, uh, medical equipment. Then, of course, uh, we came down to uh, other issues that were important in terms of supply chains. I'll come down to that as we go along. Uh, it it would therefore be fair to say that we have been in the front, at the forefront of digital diplomacy. Uh, we have been agile and versatile in our efforts to generate and maintain diplomatic momentum. Uh, India is a country with global interests, our economy and therefore our material well-being is plugged into global supply chains. We view the world as a borderless economy with an interlinked marketplace. Uh, this global spread of interests uh, and stakes makes us vulnerable on many fronts. But paradoxically, it also opens our eyes to opportunity. Empirically speaking, all crises are succeeded by uh, periods of growth. The Great Depression, the Second World War, were followed by periods of uh, secular and sustained economic growth. All the four major recessions in the post-World uh, War period were followed by a similar trend. Uh, we have witnessed uh, on our side uh, um, many such, I mean, we have, of course, uh, you know, witnessed uh, um, the uh, similar sort of situations uh, um, and we, of course, now as we go along, I think we will have to see how we can take advantage of this, uh, you know, crisis that we face uh, in a manner that is uh, uh, positive. Um, and, and, of course, how we can benefit from the opportunities. Um, the um, one of the priorities is to make India, in the words of the Prime Minister, the nerve center of global supply chains. I've uh, mentioned that. This is also in line with our vision of uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat. The Ministry of External Affairs is actively engaged with uh, our other concerned line ministries uh, in promoting India as an alternative manufacturing hub and innovation destination. Our network of diplomatic missions uh, and posts in consultation with various stakeholders is identifying export and investment opportunities for our businesses in different countries. Uh, we have reached out to and are in touch uh, with global business entities that seek to diversify their manufacturing locations. A preliminary assessment uh, indicates that in the short term, we can enhance our global presence in sectors where we have been traditionally strong, such as textiles and apparels, pharmaceuticals, gems and jewelry, chemicals, etc. We can increase production in these sectors to cater to both local and global demand. But in the medium to long term, uh, we must move up the value chain in sectors such as electronics, pharma, engineering, design outsourcing, and so on and so forth. Eventually, our aim should be um, uh, high value addition uh, activities. Uh, we also need to work on development of uh, cutting edge technologies and intellectual property across industries. There are areas that we have seen growth uh, even through this pandemic. Uh, the digital space is one such. Uh, you would have noted large investments by global technology majors. Um, Google invested $10 billion, uh, Facebook $5 billion. Uh, Mubadala, which is the UAE's uh, sovereign wealth fund, invested uh, $1.2 billion. Uh, we have strong credentials in this area. The Jam Trinity, that is Chandan, Aadhaar and Mobile, pioneered by this government, has set the stage for a fintech revolution. Uh, the Prime Minister earlier launched a global digital platform, Apex, to connect fintech companies and financial institutions. We are also working with several countries on making our digital payment systems interoperable. Our payment systems such as Ru the Rupee card have already been launched in Singapore, in Bhutan, the UAE and Bahrain. It would be important to highlight the importance of uh, Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan in a forum such as this. Uh, I have already stated earlier uh, my views on the Abhiyan on, and on Atma Nirbhar Bharat and I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate some of the salient features. First and foremost, of course, Atma Nirbharta is not uh, about uh, seeking self-centered arrangements. Its essential aim is to ensure uh, India's position as a key participant in global supply chains, to building capacities at home. Uh, we can also contribute uh, to mitigating disruptions in global markets. It is important to identify products and commodities where India has the ability uh, or potential to expand domestic production and enhance global availability. Uh, there is no contradiction between an India that's building its own economic cap capacities 
and an India that is looking to play a bigger role in global businesses, uh, trade and innovation. Uh, friends, uh, India has always believed that a part of its larger community, as a part of the larger community of nations, um, and uh, that we would uh, um, uh, realize the spirit of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, uh, that our well-being is intrinsically linked to the collective well-being of the larger global community. And we also believe in the principle of Nishkarma Karma, uh, that good, good needs to be done for its own sake. Uh, we put these teachings into practice during the COVID pandemic. Uh, India's role as a pharmacy of the world has come into focus during this crisis. Uh, we have a world-class pharmaceutical industry uh, that is producer that is a producer of choice for critical uh, medications with brand recognition in all geographies and markets. The pandem pandemic produced an explosion of demand uh, for drugs such as hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol produced in India. In a coordinated response involving uh, several branches of government and multiple private sector pharma companies, India was able to supply after ensuring adequate domestic supply or rather uh, that we are meeting the domestic demand, uh, um, large volumes of these drugs to friends and consumers across the world. In the face of uh, daunting logistical challenges imposed by the lockdown, Indian drugs and medical supplies reached more than 180 countries. Um, Mission Sagar, Operation Sanjeevani, the deployment of medical rapid response teams for COVID assistance in several countries, the linking of health professionals, and the pooling of health capacities are not just independent and isolated facts, but represent our central beliefs and aspirations. They reflect the Prime Minister's vision of putting people at the center of our efforts for global cooperation. In line with this vision, India went out of its way to positively contribute to global health security in the midst of the pandemic. We took a far-sighted view to be a responsible actor on the global stage in these very difficult circumstances. This has elevated India's international standing and will continue to stand us in good stead in the post-pandemic world. The novel coronavirus outbreak has come as a major geopolitical shock, uh, which, which will have a long-term impact on world politics. Uh, we are likely to see changes in hard and soft power balances, emergence, emergence of new multilateral conversations, and changes in relative strengths of stakeholders in these conversations, and a greater dispersal of power, resources, and capacity across the world. India's choices, challenges, and opportunities in this new global environment will also be affected. Some things, however, will not change. The fundamental orientation of our policies remains neighborhood first. We have demonstrated the priority accorded to our neighbors in South Asia at the highest levels. This is also evident during the current crisis when the Prime Minister uh, took the initiative early on to engage with the leaders of South Asia. I may point out that even uh, during this pandemic period, the uh, first visit I made uh, was to our neighbor and close friend, Bangladesh. Of course, another important pillar of our foreign policy is Act East, to which we have given a renewed push to enhancing ties with uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, we have a growing dialogue with these countries uh, through multiple channels. Uh, the External Affairs Minister at a recent meeting of Indian and ASEAN think tanks uh, said the following, and I quote, ASEAN is one of the crossroads of the global economy. India is the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, we not only proximate each other, we are not only proximate to each other, but together help shape Asia and the world. It is important at this juncture we put our heads together. We have strengthened our partnerships in the Indian Ocean region under the Prime Minister's vision of security and growth for all in the region, or SAGAR. In the past five years, Think West. Our outreach to the Gulf and West Asian countries has become an increasingly important pillar of our foreign policy. Uh, in the pandemic period, our partners in the Gulf and West Asia have cooperated with us unstintingly to mutual benefit uh, and with the enhancement of mutual trust. As you are aware, a lot of our compatriots uh, had to be repatriated. Many of them lost their jobs in the COVID crisis. But at the same time, um, the West Asian countries sought from us uh, expertise in human resource terms, uh, and also uh, expertise in, in managing the COVID crisis in their countries. And I think uh, it is important that uh, we work with these countries and as they recover from the COVID crisis, as they come back, uh, you know, we will uh, both, uh, we will mutually benefit. Our engagement with Africa has also intensified as never before, with over 30 visits to African countries, the level of the President, Vice President, Prime Minister. Of course, this was before the COVID uh, crisis and before the lockdown. Over two-thirds of India's lines of credit uh, 
in the past few decades have been offered to African countries. Uh, we have increasingly taken on the role of a net security provider in our neighborhood and beyond. The COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated our willingness and capabilities to support our friends and partners uh, in this difficult period, especially when capacity of several countries to deal with the pandemic has been constrained. In our own neighborhood, we have seen that uh, countries such as Bhutan, Maldives, Mauritius have been, their economies have been very greatly affected because they rely quite significantly on tourism, and tourism is one of the worst hit sectors during this period. Um, and this is something that uh, I think uh, many of our close friends look to us for support uh, in this difficult period, and we have not been founting, uh, found wanting in this regard. Our commitment and engagement with our key uh, bilateral partner countries uh, has continued. I have already mentioned the India-EU summit. Uh, I have also referred to the operational tempo through digital means of our diplomacy during the pandemic. Uh, we have kept in touch with all our partners, whether it's the United States, whether it's Russia, Japan, and so on and so forth. Um, multiple meetings at multiple levels with uh, key partners. And of course, uh, in our own immediate neighborhood, we see um, you know, the most opportunities. Uh, and uh, we will work uh, to take these forward. There are also a few challenges which we will work to resolve. It must be noted, however, uh, that our capacities and resources are growing as we grow, and we will continue to be prepared to adopt the necessary strategies and tactics as required. I have earlier mentioned the, the Prime Minister's participation in the G20 in NAM and UN meetings, uh, as well as the External Affairs Minister's participation in many plurilateral and multilateral meetings. Uh, we are committed multilateralists, and our engagement in multilateral and in the multilateral and plurilateral systems uh, is growing. Um, at the UN ECOSOC, the Prime Minister said this. He said, India firmly believes that the path to achieve Sustainable peace and prosperity is through multilateralism. As children of planet Earth, we must join hands to address our common challenges and achieve our common goals. However, multilateralism needs to represent the reality of our contemporary world. Only reformed multilateralism with the reformed United Nations at its center can meet the aspirations of humanity. We have a challenging and busy agenda in the coming years. On our 75th anniversary, India will be a member of the UN Security Council. We will be the president of the G20. In the next two years, we will hold the presidency of the BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We will also um, be hosting the um, India-Africa Forum Summit and the, uh, our summit with uh, the Pacific Island States, the Federation of uh, Pacific Island States. And all this is in recognition of our enhanced global standing and also provides opportunities for us to convey our perceptions, our expectations, and our priorities, not just for ourselves, but for our shared world. So in diplomacy terms, the next two years represents a calendar that is quite unique. I think we will never have the sort of uh, high-level visitors uh, that we will have in one go in the next couple of years. Uh, we will never have the opportunity to present uh, the modern face of India, uh, as we mentioned, a growing, aspirational, optimistic India to the rest of the world in the manner that we will have the opportunity to do in the next couple of years. So this, for diplomacy, is a very important time. We deploy a lot of resources through development partnerships with our friends. This is a practical demonstration of our goodwill and our capacities and our belief in the principle of Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, and Sabka Vishwas. Development partnership is work in progress, and we're taking a close look at how we can calibrate partnerships, meet the needs of our friends as per their priorities uh, and preferred roadmaps. Our focus will continue to be on executing viable projects and on strengthening capacities in local communities. One of the issues that uh, we, have been for, we have been dealing with uh, and we have been, uh, uh, I would say, advocating uh, the need for greater global cooperation is on terrorism. Um, we are, uh, of course, uh, uh, involved with resisting uh, the threat of uh, terrorism. Uh, we are directly in the, I would say, a, a target of, of global and cross-border terrorism. Radical ideologies continue to generate violence and insecurity. As a country, as, as a country that has faced terrorism, we are steadfast in seeking action against terrorists and their sponsors. Uh, while our efforts in this regard has found uh, global support and resonance. We need to ensure that uh, the world follows an undifferentiated and unambiguous approach to terrorism. Pub politicization of global mechanisms such as UN listings and also the uh, 
uh, uh, FATF, uh, I think, needs to be avoided. And we need to ensure that the global community uh, finalizes, concludes uh, the comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism, which India has uh, proposed in the UN. There are other threats, non-traditional threats. I mean, we are dealing with one of them, that's the COVID pandemic. Bio threats, uh, the requirement of, uh, uh, you know, cyber security is, uh, you know, cyber threat is very, very, I would say, topical in this digital world that we live in. Um, and uh, in the midst of this crisis, uh, we were reminded of the vital role that our diplomatic uh, missions and posts play abroad. Um, the Prime Minister himself uh, found time to address all our heads of missions and posts uh, in this COVID times. Uh, and uh, they have been the first responders to Indians abroad. As you know, uh, we had to institute the lockdown. A very large number of our compatriots were stranded abroad. Uh, our missions and posts were given the task of ensuring their welfare and uh, to making sure that there was enough coordination with our uh, community association to provide relief, both directly and indirectly to them. And as a, as a ministry, we remain committed to providing timely, effective and efficient public services and being responsive to the needs of our citizens uh, abroad. In this uh, context, I would like to draw your attention to the Vande Bharat mission. Uh, as you are aware, uh, more than 1.3 million Indians have returned uh, to our country during this pandemic through land, sea and uh, air uh, routes. Uh, this is the largest such exercise ever undertaken uh, by any government in India, involving multiple stakeholders, multiple phases, multiple transportation networks and multiple destinations and points of origin. I am part of a dialogue which is called the Indo-Pacific Dialogue, which involves my uh, counterparts from several uh, countries, uh, ranging from Japan and Australia to the United States and Vietnam. Um, actually, when I mentioned the dimensions of our, one, of our repatriation program and the Vande Bharat mission, they were amazed because no country deals with the sort of magnitude that we have dealt with, uh, uh, provides the logistical backup and facilitation that uh, we have extended. And I think uh, it is important that uh, we continue to be in a position to ensure that uh, the support that we provide for our citizens uh, uh, abroad uh, is, is, is not only uh, continued but also uh, strengthened over time. Uh, and if I had to leave you with a, with a concluding thought, it would be a quote from Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, he prayed not only to be sheltered from danger but to be without fear in facing it. And I think those words are very, very appropriate today. Uh, these are not normal times. We did not choose to be here. But now that we are, we will do our best to adapt and advance. So I will stop here. And thank you very much. And we will take up the next part of our. Thank you. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary, for your wide ranging uh, address and remarks. It really is a reminder that uh, India never has had and it can never have a single issue or a single theme that dominated uh, foreign policy and your address touched on all its different uh, dimensions, neighborhood first, Southeast Asia, looking east, the Gulf, Africa, terrorism. But you also spoke about the importance of uh, advancing the agenda of non-traditional uh, security. We are in the midst of a, a pandemic and uh, your remarks at the end that we are not living in normal times and we did not choose to be here, uh, really is uh, very appropriately sums up uh, the challenges which face us and the confidence with which uh, you and the government are facing up uh, to this uh, environment. Now, we are deluged with uh, questions, but I'll begin, uh, if I may, uh, using my uh, advantageous position by asking you something uh, which I think you are uniquely equipped uh, to answer. Uh, you have yourself a very, very rich uh, experience of uh, serving in the Bay of Bengal uh, region. You have been in, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, in Thailand. You have handled while in the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, uh, Bhutan and Nepal. And that really is the uh, many, uh, in many ways, many of the vital components of the Bay of Bengal community and uh, BIMSTEC. Uh, and certainly BIMSTEC has an importance which we all uh, appreciate and agree with and it is good we are giving so much importance to it. But the Prime Minister recently highlighted by convening a summit of virtual summit uh, of SARC uh, leaders 
to address the pandemic, the narrative value and the importance of uh, SARC. Uh, and how do you see in the future our relationship both with SARC and with BIMSTEC? Is there a risk of our underplaying one at the expense of the other? Or do you think we can push ahead on both fronts? Oh, thank you, um, Raghavan. I think that's a very pertinent question as we seek to build upon uh, regional cooperation. Uh, SARC, of course, has been um, you know, uh, uh, an organization that has existed for some time. Uh, it has served a certain purpose in providing developmental cooperation and cohesion in our South Asian region. Uh, BIMSTEC, in, in comparative term, uh, terms, is relatively new. Uh, if you see both these groupings, you have a fairly large common membership. Um, um, perhaps uh, SARC goes a little westwards and BIMSTEC goes a little eastwards. Um, but, uh, but generally, uh, you know, you have a fairly uh, uh, representative membership in both of these uh, regional organizations. Now, of course, when you look at SARC, uh, uh, if, if you see uh, the fact that the Prime Minister and you mentioned that uh, chose uh, to use SARC as a mechanism uh, to reach out to South Asian leaders uh, during the initial phase of the pandemic, uh, I think it was uh, a gesture that was appreciated by uh, the entire SARC leadership. Um, it facilitated cooperation at a level that uh, did not exist earlier. Uh, we were able to uh, initiate the SARC Emergency Response Fund. India committed $10 billion to it, but each and every SARC country also put in money to this. And this has been uh, the reservoir which is provided for our supply of medicines, equipment, test kits to many of our neighboring countries, uh, including rapid response teams to some of our neighbors uh, to help them deal with the capacity constraints uh, uh, that they faced uh, in dealing with the magnitude of this uh, crisis. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, it also provided for a platform for health experts to consult on best practices, lessons learned. Very important when you deal with a pandemic of which you have very little knowledge. Uh, and to, in today's context, of course, uh, there is a conversation also with our closest friends and partners about how we can uh, cooperate on issues such as uh, uh, you know, uh, therapeutics and, and vaccines that may emerge as a result of uh, research and development uh, that some of us are doing. Um, but uh, SARC has had its limitations as we, have, as we have found. You need a consensus within SARC. You need political will within SARC. Clearly, uh, not all of us have displayed that political will. Uh, one of our uh, neighbors has been consistently uh, involved in blocking SARC in all of its constructive activities. Uh, now, of course, if you take any initiative within SARC, uh, you need consensus and any initiative that is constructive is blocked. BIMSTEC provided us with an alternative uh, mechanism. Uh, BIMSTEC has been a vital and unique link between South and Southeast Asia. Uh, it is a true representative of the Bay of Bengal region, which encompasses uh, not only South Asia, but Southeast Asia with uh, Myanmar and uh, Thailand as part of this uh, grouping. It has uh, been... Uh, revitalized by its involvement uh, uh, in, uh, in the 2018 uh, summit uh, that was held and also their involvement uh, at, the, uh, at the BRICS uh, summit in Goa. And BIMSTEC leaders were invited to join the BRICS summit. As you know, every chair has a re uh, reserves uh, the option of inviting other heads of state and government and we chose to invite the BIMSTEC leaders. All of them came for the summit and it was a very, very unique opportunity uh, from that point of view, to bring our closest partners uh, and neighbors uh, onto uh, a larger global platform. And in a certain sense, you, you had the opportunity for regional collaboration with the global, well, global in terms of representation uh, grouping. So I think uh, BIMSTEC is moving forward. Sri Lanka is the chair. Sri Lanka is very keen, like all of us, to take BIMSTEC forward. We are looking at a BIMSTEC summit uh, in the near future, as and when uh, we can uh, you know, have the ability to do so uh, in, in the light of the current situation. But uh, I think there is uh, scope to take that forward. And uh, and I think uh, it, it would be fair to say that we haven't given up on any grouping uh, as and when, uh, you know, uh, there is the ability to move forward uh, in terms of both, uh, uh, you know, uh, peace and stability, uh, in terms of both uh, political will and uh, the uh, sort of... Uh, um, let's say, willingness uh, not to obstruct uh, and I would say uh, the, um, you know, uh, desire for more constructive engagement involving development, involving people-to-people -people ties. I think that's when 
SARC will become activated. But as of now, BM stake is certainly a mechanism that is going places. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary. Uh, may I ask Professor Shuranjan Das, Vice Chancellor, Jadavpur University, to uh, to ask his question next, please. Uh, well, uh, Ambassador Raghavan, Mr. Uh, Shrigla, nice seeing you after a long time. Dr. Nibedi Taral, my distinguished co-panelists and participants. Could I first say a big thank you to ICW, especially Dr. Raghavan, for enabling me to join this uh, program. It was indeed a privilege to listen to the succinct and incisive analysis from Mr. Shringla about Indian foreign policy in the pandemic period. Since each of the panelists have one minute each, I would like to quickly raise four pointed questions for our distinguished speaker. Number one, in contemporary Indian official discourses, we now find a stress on multi-alignment. Does it mean a redefinition of the principle of non-alignment or is it the shift from the traditional dictum of non-alignment? That's question one. Question two, Mr. Shringla, you rightly referred to the Indo-Pacific dialogue. Now, in this context, could I say that the Indian government has been in recent times averse to the idea of joining the 15th nation regional comprehensive economic partnership. But the BJP General Secretary, Mr. Ram Madhav, has recently been quoted in the Hindu as saying that New Delhi should show some flexibility on the issue of joining the RCEP. And, and he made a partisan remark, I quote, because if you want to be a good global player, player you cannot be out of all institutions, unquote. My question is, does this signify a new shift in South Bloc's thinking on RCEP? Third, so our honorable prime minister, all right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Should we take a few more questions, uh, and then come back? So, Professor uh, Dr. Dhanraj, Chairman of the Center for Policy and uh, uh, Public Policy Research, uh, uh, please ask your question, Dr. Dhanraj. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, thank you, Forest Secretary, for your uh, exquisite speech. Uh, my, I'm coming from Kerala. I represent, uh, I'm hailing from Krechi. So, you know, uh, there's a huge diaspora in Gulf countries and hundred thousands of are coming back. And now there is a fear among those people who return to Kerala that uh, some of the Middle East countries are going to set, uh, strengthen their quota, quota system. So they, many of them share this concern because uh, when H1B1 visa is uh, discussed, a uh, lot of media attention. But unfortunately, when quota system is strengthened in, in Gulf countries, uh, not many are talking about it. So my question is whether Indian government is actively engaging Middle Eastern uh, countries uh, to uh, mitigate this challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I ask uh, Professor Rahul Tripathi, uh, to also ask his question now from uh, the University of Goa. Yes, sir. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks to ICWA for this wonderful interaction, calling university professors uh, at a meeting with uh, the foreign secretary. I just want to share that Goa University has just opened its online classes and I started my course on India's foreign policy just today. And what a way to begin the course uh, than to talk to the foreign secretary himself. <clears throat> I have a very, very pointed comment and a question which is linked to what Ambassador Raghavan said. Uh, I would like to bring in a certain amount of realism in these times of uh, very, very pragmatic cooperation that is called for as far as our neighborhood is concerned. So I would like to say that perhaps uh, COVID gives India an opportunity to reclaim its neighborhood policy, neighborhood first policy, which was appearing to be drifting a bit uh, in the past, uh, the way China was penetrating. I think by building up on uh, our sub-regional cooperation, uh, focusing on human development, uh, we will be able to create and generate a lot of goodwill as far as these South Asian countries are concerned. And in the long run, Perhaps that could be our counter to the, the deep pocket diplomacy that China does. So is there a thinking, sir, within 
the MEA within the policy establishment of of a, a, a renewed push to the neighborhood first, building up on these small small projects, which could gain a lot in the long run. Thank you. Uh, may I may I now ask Dr. Anamika Singh uh, from the Girls Post Postgraduate College Hathras uh, to ask her question quickly, please. Thank you, sir. Very good evening, sir. My question is China specific, uh, sir. Uh, it, uh, we know that China has started aggression along the line of uh, actual control in Ladakh just after a month of our uh, 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations. Uh, so, looking at this uh, assertive and aggressive uh, wolf warrior diplomatic uh, and military tactics, uh, do you think? whether India needs to change her China policy substantially. Thank you. Uh, sorry, we'll take one more one more question uh, from the panel before we come to the chat box. And I invite Dr. Mona Lisa Tase Department of Political Science, Nagaland University, to ask her question. Hello, good evening. Is it audible? Yes. Is it audible? Yes, go okay. ahead. Okay. My question is, uh, since India and uh, her new economic relation with Southeast and Southeast Asian countries now uh, is now driven by the domestic imperative of Northeast India, but North is in India is digital platform is a far cry. I missed the first part of introduction because I was completely out of uh, connected. I, I could not connect with you. I'm thankful that I'm with you now. So when we talk about uh, digital diplomacy, my question is, how is it going to be a uh, uh, functional for North East? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Foreign Secretary, we could take these five and then I'll come to some questions on the uh, on the chat box. Well, um, let me start with Professor Suranjan Das, who spoke about, uh, he had four questions, but two of which were, I think, uh, conveyed. Uh, the first was the issue of, uh, you know, whether we uh, prefer uh, multi-alignment or non-alignment, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, um, we don't want to define ourselves uh, in, 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 in any particular, uh, uh, I would say, uh, rubric in terms of uh, our engagement uh, globally. Uh, we are a country that has engaged extensively. I mean, some of my uh, initial remarks covered uh, the level of our engagement, uh, whether it is uh, exclusive grouping like the G20 or it is grouping like the non-aligned movement whether it is the United Nations or whether it is BRICS, ACO or uh, RIC or, uh, you know, other groupings that are there, uh, we are present uh, in these groupings. Many of them are mutually exclusive. Many of them have overlapping areas of interest, but uh, we uh, are prevalent in all of these. Whether they're regional groupings, uh, plurilateral groupings, multilateral groupings, I think for us, uh, engagement globally as a country of 1.3 billion people, uh, as a country with a young population that is aspirational, uh, as a country with a diaspora of uh, 25 to 30 million, uh, you know, of its uh, people abroad, uh, our, uh, we, I think, don't have a choice but to engage, engage constructively with the global community at different levels. So uh, whether you term it as multi-alignment uh, or non-alignment, I think uh, uh, we are prevalent uh, in, in all of this. Uh, what is important, I think, is, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, the uh, desire and necessity to engage uh, all our partners. Uh, I think uh, uh, as far as we are concerned, that this, we are, uh, in terms of our foreign policy, equal opportunists. Uh, we engage with all concerned, uh, some positively, uh, in some that we need to engage uh, in a more cautious manner. But what is important is that uh, we uh, are, uh, you know, inclined uh, to, um, um, let us say, build uh, synergies, uh, build uh, connectivity, uh, build contacts, uh, build relationships uh, that are ultimately to our uh, national interests and those and the interests of our people. That's very important. So I'm just putting it in a very 
I would say a theoretical construct, uh, but uh, I think uh, you can understand uh, from that uh, what uh, is the general approach uh, that we've been following, not now, but following uh, traditionally uh, over time. Uh, your second issue was uh, the reference to RCEP, or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, out of which we have withdrawn. Uh, I think here it is important to understand when we seek uh, preferential trade agreements, free trade agreements, when we seek uh, uh, alliances uh, that are uh, exclusive in terms of uh, trade, in terms of economic engagements, uh, the only imperative that uh, uh, provides uh, uh, us with the backdrop in which we engage is our national interest. Uh, if it suits our national interest, we will engage. If it doesn't, I think uh, we retain the option to uh, withdraw from this or any other grouping that we are uh, part of. And I think that is uh, where the decision was taken, that RCEP did not seem to be something that would be in our uh, interest, uh, both now and in the future. And we have withdrawn whether we re-engage, whether we will be uh, looking at this uh, and re-examining it again. This is not uh, something that I can say. This is for uh, government to examine uh, comprehensively. Uh, as of now, we are not part of that process. And uh, even though we have spent some time in engaging, I think uh, ultimately uh, we came to the conclusion that this did not suit our national interest. Uh, moving on to uh, Professor Dhanraj uh, uh, from uh, Kerala, you correctly pointed out uh, that our diaspora in the Gulf is very important. Uh, we have 10 million, uh, 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 10 uh, good significant, I mean, 8 to 10 million of our citizens who are in, in that uh, part of the world. Uh, they are a very uh, valuable source uh, of uh, remittances in India. They are also a very, very uh, uh, strong professional uh, community that we have, and their skills in many senses are unmatched. Uh, as we see a meltdown in many uh, situations because of COVID, uh, lockdown, etc., has prevented normal economic activity. I did mention that that our endeavour is to uh, um, see how uh, these uh, economies will will sort of uh, come back uh, and recover, and how we can contribute to that process. And and I think the best way we can contribute there, of course, is through um, I would say our human resource, uh, uh, providing our human resource potential. We have already seen that there is a slight uh, realignment in what is required in terms of uh, professional uh, skills. Uh, uh, what could be earlier, uh, you know, an area of high demand, uh, it could be in the tourism sector, hospitality sector. Today, it could be the health sector, it could be some other sector. Uh, you will be happy to know that each and every person who comes back to India under the Vande Bharat mission, uh, his database uh, is, is preserved. Uh, that means we have taken exactly what skills he represents. He could be uh, he could be a specialist uh, in construction. He could be a specialist uh, uh, in in the health sector. He could be a specialist uh, in the education sector. All that has been retained, and our uh, uh, you know uh, Ministry of Labour and uh, of course uh, uh, Skills Development has maintained this data and they've reached out to each and every person to see how we can reskill them, retrain them, and then uh, make sure that they are equipped to deal with the new opportunities that come up. In that context, we are also negotiating social mobility agreements with a number of countries. Uh, social mobility agreements whereby we can provide uh, trained, skilled manpower. Uh, by manpower, I mean it could be professional manpower, it could be in labor terms, but uh, we are ready to provide uh, that manpower that that country requires. And I think the greatest asset, of course, we have is human resource. And this is something that our diplomacy and our government's effort has been, has to be at the forefront of promoting that diplomacy. So I can assure you that as far as the Gulf is concerned, we will be engaged. We will ensure that the, uh, I would say, the uh, opportunities and advantages that uh, our citizens enjoy will continue to remain. We have the best of relations with uh, with the Gulf countries. Uh, these have been further strengthened in recent years by initiatives that our Prime Minister has taken, by our, that the government has taken, and you can be rest assured that uh, our citizens in the Gulf will receive the best uh, 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 I would say, uh, opportunities that those countries provide. Um, moving on to uh, Professor Rahul Tripathi from Goa. Uh, I think uh, you talked about, uh, you know, ensuring that there's pragmatic cooperation in the neighborhood, uh, that uh, uh, we should examine opportunities of human development uh, in, in our region. Uh, I think uh, as far as the neighborhood first uh, policy is concerned, uh, our neighboring countries, uh, uh, are treated within the same principle as I said, sabka saath, sabka vikas. Uh, or not only in development priorities, uh, if you see our 
development partnership profile at least uh, uh, a good uh, 30 to 35 percent of this goes to our immediate neighborhood. Uh, we uh, not only do large uh, projects that are financed under the lines of credit, but we do small community development programs, what are called high impact community development programs. Uh, when I was High Commissioner in Bangladesh, we used this very effectively, uh, had uh, programs that were suited to communities, uh, quick gestation programs uh, that were focused in the areas that you're talking about, creating a people to people connect. Uh, uh, creating um, uh, capacity building in education, creating health centers, uh, creating um, drinking water supply, uh, essentially everywhere where uh, there was a requirement that uh, uh, could uh, bring us uh, the sort of, uh, um, I would say, um, a credibility that we need to create uh, with our neighborhood. Uh, and I think this is something that we will continue to pursue. And you're right in saying that uh, the current situation does provide more opportunities to reach out to our neighbors to ensure that we are not only, um, you know, first responders to crisis, and this is also something I can come to later, but also in many senses, net security providers in our neighborhood. Um, one of the areas uh, I must also add here is that we have allowed, uh, in the in even in the period of the lockdown, trade, commerce, and normal activity to continue with our neighbors, with uh, Nepal, with Bangladesh, with Bhutan. Uh, we have not allowed that to suffer. And I think that's, uh, again, uh, very important. Uh, we also are trying to ensure that as we come up with our own, uh, you know, vaccine programs, uh, the Prime Minister on Independence Day mentioned that we have three uh, different vaccine programs that have reached a certain level of, uh, of attainment. Um, once we understand from the scientists that they're ready, we will be manufacturing vaccines on a massive scale. As we do this, we must ensure that our neighborhood is prioritized, our friends and our partners are prioritized. And that in uh, providing vaccines to our own uh, citizens, uh, uh, considering that we, we you know, are today producing 60% of the world's vaccines, we have the capacity, we will ensure that the vaccine is made, uh, uh, you know, affordable, equitable uh, opportunity for those of us, uh, those of our neighbors that are, uh, that uh, depend on us in, in this sense uh, will, will not be found wanting in that regard. Um, um, Dr. Anamika Singh um, um, uh, from Hathras, uh, you spoke about the China factor. You said that uh, whether uh, we should have a change in, in policy in the light of uh, Chinese aggression, uh, Chinese transgressions uh, that you, you referred to. Uh, I think uh, you are right in saying that we have had uh, an unprecedented situation on our Indo-India-China border. Uh, we have never had this sort of situation since 1962. I also mentioned that we have lost for the first time uh, lives of soldiers, uh, which has not happened in the last 40 years. It is an unprecedented situation. We have also seen um, that uh, there has been uh, an attempt to take unilateral action that, is, uh, uh, that uh, seems to be uh, an effort to change facts on the ground. Uh, I have also said that we will be firm and resolute in resisting this. Uh, and uh, as far as we are concerned, there will be no compromise in our sovereignty and territorial integrity. At the same time, we are, uh, as a responsible nation, always willing to talk, always willing to engage, uh, even in the, um, I would say, in the depth of the COVID crisis, we have kept our com communication lines open. Our senior commanders have been talking on the ground. Uh, diplomats have been talking uh, to each other, both in Beijing and New Delhi. Even as we speak, uh, ground commanders are talking to each other. Uh, but it is a fact that, uh, you know, it cannot be business as usual. Um, you know, unless there is peace and tranquility in our border areas, um, the normal bilateral relationship will be affected. There is a linkage between uh, what is happening on the border and our larger relationship. And, and that fact, I think, is, is very, very evident. Uh, as we seek to resolve these issues and as we seek to maintain and revert to the status quo that existed uh, before uh, such uh, aggressive actions took place, uh, as we seek to de-escalate and de-engage, uh, I think uh, that could be uh, a way that we could go back to where we were, but not until then. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Monalisa Das had a very good point uh, about uh, digital connectivity in the Northeast. Uh, uh, I myself belong uh, to the Northeast region. I'm very sensitive to the fact that uh, when we talk about digital India and the Prime Minister's vision, of reaching to every corner of the country, uh, you know, uh, through the JAM scheme. Uh, uh, I think it is important that connectivity is maintained and we have good uh, connections uh, every, in every part of our country. 
and i must say that in that context uh, you know the fact that we sought uh, an internet broadband gateway from cox's bazar you know there are different internet gateways now in india it comes from chennai whereas in bangladesh is in cox's bazar and we asked the bangladeshis to provide us a line that will go up to our northeast i think there are still issues there i mean the cost is one thing and also quality is the other but we have tried to provide alternative access to our northeast and i think as we go along uh, i'm sure that connectivity will increase and uh, and you know as we uh, will engage uh, in future you will have better connections uh, to go by uh, but it's very clear that uh, digital india is uh, a, a scheme that is to bridge the digital gap uh, between urban and rural india between uh, you know i would say uh, an india that is more i uh, uh, more advantage than those who are in other parts uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know class uh, it bridges lots of gaps and i think one of the gaps also is uh, the most important thing is that a digital gap uh, has to be bridged by providing uh, not only the facilities but uh, the ability to access uh, the digital infrastructure uh, so that everybody is on a level playing field as far as uh, that is concerned so uh, i guess uh, we can stop here and take uh, more questions and back to you uh, dr akam well foreign secretary as it happens we have run out of time but maybe take four or five more minutes of your time and ask some of the questions which have come up on the chat now many of the points you have already touched on there were a large number of questions on china on south asia and so on but there is one point which i'm sure people would want to know more about and the panel was also discussing it before we started formally which is the the which is on the absence of face to face diplomacy and how much of a difference does it uh, make in the actual conduct of uh, relations with other uh, with other uh, countries and i'll take up one this question was asked uh, by a number of people in the uh, in the chat box uh, there is also a second theme which although you addressed in your remarks has come up in a number of questions which is that on the one hand we talk about international cooperation uh, and on the other hand we are striving for atma nirbharta and how will you reconcile these two opposing uh, concepts now you addressed this in your remarks but nevertheless i thought since there are a number of questions on this i would uh, ask you to comment uh, on this uh, also sure um, i'm sir i'm not in a hurry we have taken the opportunity to get a lot of our friends from all over the country and uh, we must do full justice to them so please uh, take your time uh, um uh master raghavan now as far as uh, face to face diplomacy is concerned this is a very good question and i think this is in the heart of uh, what i was uh, what i did say and what i expected to say is that diplomacy has always relied on personal contact in other words you meet someone uh, you talk to the person uh, there are nuances there you try and pick up those nuances uh, you also find opportunities to talk on the side and try and understand beyond what is said uh, uh, you know across the table uh all that is certainly missing in today's context of digital diplomacy uh you also can't talk in a certain level of confidentiality with your friends and partners because uh, you know this is an open line and just as we are talking as you talk to your counterparts uh, from different countries you have to be cautious that uh, everything you say uh does not become um you know in some senses controversial uh, uh, for others now um um to it, we are trying to obviate that uh, i mean it it goes without saying that uh, one of the ways is to ask your master in that country you use your own uh, you know uh, outreach with uh, the masters of those countries here but another thing as you've seen our raksha mantri is in moscow this is second visit to moscow our external affairs minister will be visiting moscow shortly i myself chose to go to bangladesh the reason i chose to go to bangladesh is very simple that in the covid times when there's hardly any communication uh, uh, there is in some senses an absence of news uh, it leads uh, to not only a stalemate in your cooperation but also uh, the possibilities of doubts and suspicions that creep in uh, which may or may not be true which may be relevant may be irrelevant but it's important to have the opportunity to go call on the leadership call on your counterparts to be able to talk to them and say this is what we're doing and this is what we want to do how can we take things forward and i i believe me it makes a tremendous difference and and i can say it from my own visit to bangladesh that um you know when i called on the prime minister she was extremely happy to see us it led to a very very good conversation 
I met my counterpart, the Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh. We uh, spoke extensively. I spoke to at least 40 or 50 other people uh, when I was there, uh, people that I knew. And I think this is what diplomacy is all about, the connect that you make, uh, the networking that you do, and the direct uh, relationships that you establish with people, I think is what determines uh, the success or otherwise of any diplomatic uh, effort. And uh, I think as time goes by, uh, irrespective of the COVID situation, we will continue to strive to have more and more such direct contacts with our, with our friends and uh, with all our interlocutors. Um, as far as uh, the contradiction between international co uh, cooperation and Atma Nirbharta goes, I think that's a very good question, uh, one that the Prime Minister himself has spoken about. Uh, you know, Atma Nirbhar Bharat does not mean that you are cutting off your links with the outside world, that you are becoming insular, that in many senses uh, you are, uh, you know, looking inwards. Uh, on the contrary, what it means is that you are developing uh, self-resilience, you are developing a capacity uh, to generate, uh, you know, your own, uh, uh, let's say, economic worth. Uh, in this case, as I mentioned, uh, our ability to contribute to global supply chains. We've always talked about safe, secure, and resilient uh, supply chains. Uh, as we work towards uh, developing our own capacities. Look, uh, during the COVID crisis, one thing that became very evident to us is that at a time of need, we realized that there was a lot of critical items that we needed to produce that we didn't have. If you look at uh, PPEs, masks, test kits, ventilators, uh, in the beginning we had uh, a very, very minimal supply of these items and we were of course uh, very uh, obviously eager to get as much of this as possible given the sort of uh, uh, dimensions uh, in, in health terms that the COVID uh, crisis posed. Um, we developed capacities. Today I'm happy to say that we have ramped up our production to such a level that uh, we are in a position to export masks, export test kits, export even ventilators. And that, I think, is a very, very concrete example of uh, Atma Rinvar Bharat, where the country has come together, uh, has uh, drawn its inner resources to produce uh, goods that we have never done before. Uh, you know, uh, Bharat Electronics Limited, uh, many other companies, uh, you know, uh, automobile manufacturers, uh, for example, Maruti uh, uh, Udyog, for example, converted to manufacturing ventilators. I'm just giving an example. And I think uh, if today we have, we are uh, testing at the rate of 1.1 million persons per day, it is because we have an enormous stock of uh, test kits. Uh, uh, if we are able to export our test kits to several countries and, and gift them to several of our neighbors that are in dire need of this. Uh, the other day, Bhutan said we want 120,000 test kits. We have a crisis on our hands. Within three days, this was on Saturday, I think, that the master requested for it, and by Monday it was in Bhutan. So what I'm saying is that we have the capacity to come up and deliver, find uh, inner uh, strengths of reserves and resources, and this is what we, the Prime Minister is talking about when he talks about Atma Nirvar Bharat, is that we must develop that level of uh, ability to you know, come up uh, in our own self-capacity, in our self-resilience, and contribute in a greater way to the global cooperation uh, in, in, in terms of trade, in terms of investments, and in terms of an engagement that is always constructive uh, from our point of view. Uh, I'll stop there, uh, Master Raghavan, and uh, leave it to you. Uh, if we, we'll take two more, because I don't want sure. to presume too much on your time. Dr. Satvik Tiwari asks a question, and I quote, recently India has seen a slight bitterness in relations with our close neighbors like Nepal and Sri Lanka how to restore them in order to stop the expansionist policy of China, uh, unquote. One more of the China uh, questions. And secondly, uh, there's a question from Rohit Jadav, joining Quad or maintaining position in BRICS SCO, which suits us the best? Excellent questions, uh, as uh, the previous ones were. Um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Satvik's, uh, uh, Tiwari's question about our neighborhood uh, is uh, important. Uh, you know, neighborhood uh, first is not a term coined uh, lightly. I think uh, when we talk about uh, our immediate neighbors, I think they always uh, receive the first priority in terms of our attention. Uh, our intention, and I think uh, that if you see the fact that the Prime Minister invited on both his swearing ceremonies, uh, in 2014 and 2019, uh, heads of state and government from our neighborhood, from BIMSTEC countries, 
it is because of the fact that uh, these are those countries that uh, in terms of our relationships in terms of our engagement are the most important and we must constantly work uh, to keep that relationship in as with any neighbors as within a family there are bound to be uh, both uh, great positives but also differences that crop up and we have to work with our neighbors to ensure that those differences are minimized that they nipped in the bud that's also a challenge of our diplomacy to ensure that that is the case we must always work hand in hand in glove with our neighbors to achieve our common interest which is development uh, which is the best interest of the people of our country uh, if you uh, i think uh, mentioned the case of uh, nepal and sri lanka uh, now nepal if you see uh, the prime minister's visit to nepal in 2014 came after a gap of 14 years no prime minister of india had visited nepal he visited nepal twice that year in 2018 he visited nepal twice that year also our relationship with nepal is at a level of uh, people to people uh, contacts um, even in the covid crisis situation we ensured that trade continued the vital supplies to nepal continued we contributed uh, uh, requirements that they needed in terms of meeting the covid challenge uh, test kits ventilators uh, essentially it is a relationship that will not change it is going to be a friendly a friendly relationship the closest relationship but uh, our uh, the fact that institutionally we have a unique relationship we have open borders uh, our citizens can live in our uh, respective uh, countries our citizens can work in our countries uh, that is a unique advantage that very few countries enjoy but uh, also the fact that we have cultural and civilizational links that cannot be matched anywhere else i think is something that we need to take note of that irrespective of political vicissitudes irrespective of the ups and downs of politics and the sort of uh, i would say uh, uh uh actions that governments take uh, in responses to their own political situations um the relationship has continued and we have not allowed that to to uh, suffer in any way sri lanka has been uh, one of our closest uh, friends and partners have you seen that uh, the first visit by president gotabaya rajpaksa after his election uh, was to india the first visit by prime minister mahinda rajpaksa after he was appointed prime minister was to india the first telephone conversation that they had after the government was reelected uh, a, a few weeks ago was with our prime minister i think it's very clear that our relationship with sri lanka will remain uh, a close uh, almost fraternal relationship uh, the government in sri lanka is determined to do that we are determined to do that i think nothing will change that i think if i might summarize our neighborhood uh as we develop it is important for our neighbors to develop with us that is why we invest in our neighbors i mentioned uh that we invest 33% of our lines of credit and development partnership resources to our neighbors uh take the case of bangladesh bangladesh today is one of the fastest growing economies in the world we have invested 10 billion dollars in their development but we have done much more than that in terms of creating connectivity creating infrastructure in that country and today as that country grows our states which are which are around uh, bangladesh uh, also grow with it um meghalaya uh, tripura um uh, you, you know uh, of course west bengal is greater than but assam all of these states uh, mizoram are also benefiting from an increasing market that bangladesh represents and the fact that uh, that uh, if you see today uh, bangladesh has also uh, given us uh, the opportunity to ensure that uh, it you know we can uh, use uh, uh, its ports like chittagong and mongla ports to to provide connectivity to our northeast uh, if you have uh, lpg shortage in northeast uh, bangladesh provides you with the opportunity to to address that so it is a mutually beneficial relationship we have always said that our relations with our neighbors should be based on dignity uh, to be based on mutual self respect and on mutual benefit nothing we do will be uh, will be only beneficial for us or for you it will be beneficial for both of us and this is the uh, principle on which we say sabka vikas uh, sabka uh, sabka saath sabka vikas and sabka vishwas that is very important and this is where our neighbors i think also find that uh, they can also march uh, uh, lock and step with us and this is the sort of neighbor we want to see uh, i want to uh, round this up by saying that today uh, um, contrary to some of the impressions that are sent around our relations with our neighbors are have not been better uh, you will always have differences those differences will not uh, see the light of day we will ensure that those differences are taken care of uh, what is important is that uh, we are working together in in providing uh, the sort of uh, development framework that all of us wish to see 
And I think uh, as we go along, this will only get better and better. And this is the sort of neighborhood we would like to see. Uh, you mentioned China. I think we must not see our own neighborhood in the rubric of a third party or a third country. We have been, uh, and this is our neighborhood. Uh, these are countries with whom we share cultural and civilizational attributes. For us to be looking at another country and saying that their relationship, relationship is increasing is, I think, uh, not uh, something that we as a very large, confident uh, country, we are today uh, fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, we have a young population. We will become uh, the third largest, second largest uh, economy in the world. We should not worry about that. What is important is that we should continue resolutely to increase our connectivity, to increase our linkages, to contribute and develop our neighborhood, and finally to, to continue with the strong people-to-people -people connect that we have, which is irreplaceable. Nobody can replace us in that regard. And I'll end here and, and thank you, thank your colleagues, thank all our friends in the panel, and everybody who has taken time to listen to us for a in my view, uh, an opportunity for us also uh, to exchange uh, uh, on ideas and issues that are topical in our foreign policy uh, outlook uh, uh, today. Thank you so much, uh, Master Raghun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary. It was a wonderful experience for our panelists and for the many hundreds of people. Uh, I don't know what the precise figure is, but I know it's very, very large who have logged in to uh, hear you. It was a very wide-ranging and stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize to our panelists who didn't get to uh, talk today, but Foreign Secretary, uh, let this be something which we will do again uh, in the future. For you would have noticed the very great interest there is uh, in different parts of our country uh, in all the issues which engage the Ministry of External Affairs uh, today. Uh, and uh, you, have, you have painted a very uh, broad, uh, used a very broad brush, uh, and, and I think there is interest in that broad brush uh, approach because people don't see foreign policy as necessarily dominated by one or two issues or uh, consisting of one or two silos. So I do hope we have the opportunity to continue this discussion uh, in the future also. As I said, there are a very, very large number of questions and we could go on for hours. Uh, may I also thank all your colleagues uh, in the Ministry of External Affairs who helped us put this uh, together and of course thank my colleagues uh, in the ICWA uh, who have worked very hard uh, to create this platform uh, for future engagement uh, also. Uh, thank you very much Foreign Secretary uh, can I, once again. Can I just uh, say one more last thing if you permit me, uh, uh, Master Raghavan. Uh, that is a very important point that you raised is that uh, it's important for us to reach out uh, as much within our country as outside in order to explain what our foreign policy is. Uh, we need to demystify foreign policy. It has for too long been the citadel of a certain few. I think uh, it's very heartening to see that so many of our uh, compatriots today have joined this conversation. Uh, I fully agree with you that we must uh, do more to try and engage as widely as possible to explain what our foreign policy positions are on issues that are wide-ranging, diverse, and of interest to everybody, and of course, also have implications on all of us uh, who are participating here and within the country. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to create uh, an internship program that would enable people from different parts of the country to come and experience what working in the Ministry of External Affairs is like. We will, of course, uh, share the details of this uh, in due time, but uh, I just wanted to respond to what you said. This is a very good uh, idea of the ICWA is to broad base our discussion, to take it beyond uh, the confines of Delhi to places uh, uh, like Kerala, to uh, to Kolkata, to Nagaland, to uh, Haryana, uh, UP, and uh, and uh, and of course uh, Goa, that many of our panelists represented, and beyond. So thank you, bahut uh, bahut dhanyavad, and namaskar once again to, to all our Thank you very friends. much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Ambassador um, Raghavan, could I on behalf of the entire <laughs> panel uh, sincerely thank uh, Ambassador Raghavan for organizing this session and also express our gratitude to uh, esteemed Foreign Secretary for sparing time and sharing his thoughts with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. I now... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.